this is Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and today we're going to do Cosmic Queries with my co-host, Nagin Farsad. Nagin, welcome back to Star Talk. Oh my God. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Neil. Hey, hello. So you, 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 you're getting around. This first you have this book. What is it? How to Make White People Laugh? What was the name of that book? It, correct. It was, it's called How to Make White People I Laugh. I remembered it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you technically are not a white person. You're something else. Yes. I'm just just like this uh, bag of ethnic is what I like to call myself. Bag o ethnicity. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you're I'm, born I'm, where? I'm, a, I'm one of these one of these nice Iranian American Muslims. Okay. Uh, looking at America and figuring it out. Yeah, that no, <laughs> don't even try because we can't even figure it out. I don't know. Um, and also, you are a host of. Wait, let me let me remember. Uh, fake the nation. Oh my gosh, Neil, I'm your memory is two. so good I'm right now. No one's taking their vitamins. <laughs> yeah. It's Fake the Nation, a political comedy podcast, which you have also been on. I have been on it, and it's on uh, Sirius XM, if memory serves. Uh, we actually just moved over to HeadGum, but we think very fondly of those serious days. Yes. Okay. Very good. And I enjoyed my time on that. And I just know that I haven't gotten a second invitation. That's all. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's okay. I'll, you know, I'll deal with it. It's a very exclusive club, <laughs> Neil. And we'll get to you when we get to you. <laughs> and today we have for Cosmic Queries uh, one of my colleagues. And I love it when we have one of my colleagues because whatever astronomy I know, we're bringing them in because they know more of whatever it is we're talking about. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, they're like they're boosters for anything I could possibly do <laughs> in the show. And this is Aomawa Shields. And I and I please help me pronounce your first name, Aomawa. Did I? That's it. Aomawa. I, I get it. I get a, a, a B plus at least for that. Aomawa. <laughs> it's, it's been a delight. Uh, we haven't. I haven't seen you in in almost fifteen years. Uh, great to have you on the program, and to learn that over that time you've become an expert in the search for exoplanets and the possible signatures of life. This is really hot stuff. And anytime there's any progress in that field, I am glued to the re research papers just to, to figure out where you guys are coming from, where you are, and where you're going. And we've got a Cosmic Queries focused on that. So I think we're all in on you there. So just let me get, get a little bit of your background here. You're an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Irvine. Very cool. Beautiful campus there, by the way. And... Uh, you're specializing in Earth-sized planets orbiting low-mass stars. I think low-mass stars are like very popular in the galaxy, right? Sure <laughs> more uh, more low-mass stars than any other kind of star. So you're, you're hedging your bets there, right? Wait, so if low-mass stars were on TikTok, would they be the viral sensation? At <laughs> seventy percent, seventy percent okay. of all stars. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Now I understand. <laughs> that's how that's how they roll. And <laughs> we will add to that the fact that before she went on to get her PhD in astronomy, she got a master's in fine arts in acting. Yes. Acting. Acting. <laughs> and so well, how do you combine acting and modern astrophysics? <laughs> you can use that theater background to help communicate science. And, and this is what she's been doing. And you've got a website here, it's called risingstargirls.org. I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's promoting sort of uh, interest in science among girls of all colors and all, uh, all stripes. Uh, girls have been sort of un uh, underrepresented over the decades, uh, not only in astronomy, but all sciences. And so this is, this is wonderful and it's great to have you here, Aomawa. Thank you so much, Neil, for having me here. Um, it's really a, an honor, and I'm, I'm excited to to hear the cosmic queries and to talk about my background. Yeah, and and I and I'll I'll, I'll dip in to see how your background can inform or enhance what we know or what edu education uh, steps you've taken over your career, because I'm very much interested in that. Uh, I, I'm I'm a big fan of the arts, uh, or capital A. So uh, you know, the painting, sculpting performing, writing, 
and to have you notice notice he did not say comedy just no, no. Like, <laughs> you need a really capital a for arts if i'm going to include comedy <laughs> so oh how how have your how has your website worked what, what how does it work uh, mechanically that someone logs in and then they see material there and and, and w w take me through a a an encounter that a girl might have with your website so the Rising Star Girls is a program that I put together. It's been about six years now since it was officially a thing. Um, I had started back in grad school um, doing outreach to middle school girls of color, and I would always have some kind of interactive component. I would bring them to the planetarium at the University of Washington, where I was a, a PhD student, and I'd show them a planetarium show, and then we might do some kind of a, a project together, like making their own little planispheres, uh, star charts that they could take with them. And sometimes I would do a theater game with them. And I found that they really enjoyed that. And I think part of that was they, they knew they couldn't get it wrong. Um, middle school is that age where girls start to get quiet. They start to raise their hands less often. They That's where you lose them. More. That's right. That middle school. Right. Oh, they my gosh. Yeah, they become more focused on on their appearance and less focused on how they think and feel about the world. And so that's the crucial age. Um, that's what the literature says. And and then of course, girls of color um, have this particular uh, this particular um, they're in jeopardy because on top of the the, the age group issue, um, they're also young women of color, and um, there's just not any role models. There are not many in STEM. For them. And so um, I thought, you know, how can I put my theater background that I had um, together with the astronomy background and help these girls realize that there is so much more to them than meets the eye um, and that, that what they think and feel about the world and the universe is actually not just important, but critical to their involvement in learning about the universe. We didn't just want to pummel them with facts, or they would have to regurgitate in class. We actually wanted to um, help them to feel connected to the universe and to that star or that galaxy or that planet they were learning about in hopes that if they felt connected, for example, like by writing a poem about that planet or that star or um, drawing a picture about an exoplanet that could actually exist, making up a name for it, making decisions about whether it actually had life or not, um, that they could look up in the sky and say, that's my star, that's my galaxy. I wrote a poem about it. I, you know, to take actual ownership of what they were learning and that that, in hopes that that would, once they, and you know, hopefully continue on in astronomy, that they would feel that connection and that that connection would stay put once the heavy math came in. Um, so that's been well known where if you name something, it becomes a little more personal. And I, uh, I'm omnivorous, and so uh, when I buy a lobster and I'm about to cook it, I try to name it first, just so that I feel a little more deeply for it when I plunge it headfirst into the boiling water. Uh, so, <laughs> but this I do is that, exactly I'm, what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is actually it's, so it's you the understand. Same thing. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was just thinking about like that exact that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, NASA, of course, names all their rovers, and, and there's a participatory dimension to that that I think goes yes. very far in the ed, in educational circles. But but wait a minute. If you thought of, I read a little on your bio, you thought of making acting a career, but I forces I, of the I, universe. I, I actually kind of sort of did for a while. I Descended mean, I, I upon I, you. Oh, my gosh. So what <laughs> I probably you back? Couldn't, yeah, I mean, I always had a day job. Um, I had, you know, I had started a PhD program right out of undergrad. Um, and I sort of did that because that's what you did. And I didn't really, it wasn't really a conscious choice. Um, that PhD program was in astrophysics. And I had started it, did one year. But... I was incredibly divided. I, I, um, I, people would talk about what movie they'd gone to see or the Oscars that were coming up. And I was, oh, you know, I, I would perk up then. And, um, <laughs> but like the problem sets and the, you know, I was just, I, I wasn't 
I wasn't focused. And, weren't feeling it. Weren't feeling it. Yeah. So, and I didn't, I looked around and, you know, I did have an African-American man who was my advisor. So there, I wasn't the only, the only person of color in the department, but I was the only student of color, the only woman of color. And I didn't see a lot of astronomers around who not only looked like I did, but sort of acted like I did. Like I had this thing where I really liked wearing makeup. I liked fashion magazines. I liked um, to wear nice clothes. I, I dressed pretty fashionably and I didn't really see that as much of a... <laughs> yeah, the opposite really. It's the opposite. <laughs> I just didn't really care about that. I'm thinking it's kind of um, the opposite. <laughs> so, so there were all of these things like, and, and yeah. So I, I just, Aomua, I what you yes. did was you, you, you had a little checklist of all the things to make sure you didn't belong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I was looking. I was looking. I'm picturing I was looking you. For- I'm picturing like a double, double wears Prada astrophysics edition. Oh, yes. oh yeah, right? there you go. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, it was always like I was building a case from the moment I got there. And everything was like, yes, oh yeah, check, check, check. These are the, these are the reasons why I shouldn't be here. And when the opportunity presented itself in the form of a stodgy white old male professor who said, consider other career options. I, I took him up on it. Um, and Wait, so it just to be balance. clear, it's not that you intentionally did these things to be different. It's that these were part of who you were and that identity did not have receptors in the environment where you were to get your PhD. And so that mismatch then sent you to an off ramp. Is that a fair way to characterize it? I think that's fairly accurate. I mean, I, I can't blame it all on the outside forces. There was a lot going on internally that I take responsibility for. I think if I had known, really, really known the way I did 11 years later, what I wanted to do, there's nothing that would have stopped me from doing it. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know that then. And mm-hmm. I was very sort of um, on the edge of a precipice. Anything could have, anything could have tossed me over. And so I ended up going in the other direction. And, wait, wait, so, okay, so um, you're, so you took this off ramp and now you're a professional actor for a bit. For a and let me, well, and let me first guess. first I had to go to school. Mm-hmm. And let me guess, your parents love the idea of you going into acting. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, here's the odd thing about it. They're both performers. They're both, they're both performers and, and have been their entire lives. So, but the, but the answer is still yes. They were like, oh God. <laughs> Um, they didn't want that life for me. They were very excited about me having what they considered a much more dependable career as a scientist. Although it's certainly as everyone who's a scientist knows, it's hard to get a job in science after you get your PhD. Um, But plus if if memory serves, you also got romantically involved with an actor. So this is like double. And there was no going back. (laughs) Okay. Let's not go back. Okay. You know, but they were like, I think, I think they loved the idea of being able to say, even though they were, performer, performer, having a daughter that could say he was an astrophysicist was, was pretty awesome. They, they so gave him street sort of, cred at the parties. Yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> but I burst that bubble and was like, I'm going back into the family business, so to speak. And I think that they were certainly fearful, you know, how is she going to make a living? And But they wanted me to be happy above all else. And so they've supported that. And yeah, I, I, I sort of, during that first year in that PhD program, I applied on the DL to MFA acting programs. I had done that during senior year. Wait, on the DL that. is on the down low. On guess. the down low. Excuse me, okay. <laughs> Just have get, get the lingo, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but, and so I had applied to acting grad schools, actually along with astrophysics grad schools during um, my last year at MIT uh, in undergrad, but I hadn't got, I, I went for the fences with those. I applied to Yale, uh, the Globe at UC San Diego, and um, NYU. So famous acting places, yes. yes. Yes, and I hadn't gotten into those, and I was like, but I did get into astrophysics grad school, so I, I went. So when the second time around, I when I was like, I'm going to apply again, I sort of spread the net more widely, and I rode these sort of secret buses to Chicago from Madison, Wisconsin. On the DL. Well, on the DL. <laughs> <laughs> and um, applied and got into uh, the MFA program at UCLA. And decided to defer from my PhD astrophysics program at Wisconsin Madison, and I 
moved out to LA and and started acting school there. And I mean, Can I, I had just like, say, it's just, you yeah. also seem like, I mean, what it sounds like so far is that you've been to a crap ton of school. <laughs> is that an accurate I'm assessment? collecting degrees. <laughs> I'm collect, yes. So now it's like there's a PhD, there's an MFA, and, and I think you do the terminal degree. So we don't put right, the, right, the yeah. uh, SCB out there. But, okay, but yes. before we take a break, I just want to know who was it the North Star that called you back? Uh, what, what, what cosmic force said, uh, uh-uh. or, or was, was it come back to us? <laughs> we want you. Was it <laughs> the oh whisper God. of the wind through the trees in the, in the, in the moonless cloudless night as the universe poured from the sky back into your veins? It was smog. smog. What? <laughs> <laughs> I handed you a poetic thing. You could have said, yeah, that was it. And we could have moved on. <laughs> Being able, I'm driving through the streets of LA to, you know, odd audition after audition and these like cold fluorescent lit, fluorescently lit rooms, casting rooms and, and having my like day job at working for a cultural nonprofit and, and, Every once in a while, my eyes like crane up through the windshield and I try to see through through the smog, through the clouds. And sometimes I'm able to see a couple stars and sometimes nothing. But like when I was able to see a couple stars, it sort of like shot me back in my seat. Like, oh, that, that was another life. And then I pretend I hadn't seen it and just get back to like driving in gridlock and, you know, trying to get to my job and put my flyers for different cultural programs around the city. And, but I kept, that kept happening. And I thought someone asked me, a friend asked me like, did you miss astronomy? Cause you could probably get a better paying day job doing that than your little cultural arts nonprofit or your temp jobs. I once pulled staples out of paper for a year and a half for a, uh, prof- a music publishing company that had to have all of their contracts <laughs> scanned <laughs> they had to have them all scanned, so they had they hired three temps to sit in a room and pull staples out of. You the can't contracts. scan documents that are stapled together. Yeah. You just you can't. Cannot. Yeah, you just yeah. can't. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. You know, I just want to say, as a, a still a, a comedian and actor, I still go to auditions, and sometimes I look up into the sky, and then I think to myself. Like I could really eat a burger right now. So very similar. <laughs> it's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I still like the fact that you you had applied to uh, pre- premier acting schools and they rejected you. So I guess I'll have to go to astrophysics graduate school. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> it reminds me, there's a Gary Larson comic where Einstein was playing basketball, right? And the caption is, um, uh, Albert Einstein was going to be a star basketball player until an ankle injury turned him to physics <laughs> and then he became a physicist. <gasps> Oh my God. Anyway, we got to take a break. When we come back, more with Aomawa Shields and her the story of her life. And we're going to bring in some cosmic queries that tap her expertise on planets around other stars and the possibility of life on Star Talk. We're back. Star Talk Cosmic Queries. I got my co host, Nagin Prasad. Always good to have you here, Nagin. Oh, so happy to be here. Yeah, and we have with us Aomoa Shields, a colleague of mine at University of California, Irvine, and she specializes in planets orbiting stars in the search for life. And to me, that's the hottest topic in all of science, not just within astrophysics. And uh, Nagin, you've collected uh, cosmic queries for her. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I'm here to either just not say anything or if, because <laughs> this is all for you. Uh, but if, uh, if, if there's something I think I can contribute, I, I will, but probably not. So uh, let's jump right in. Um, well, we um, actually, before we get into some of the more sciencey questions, Jiraj Petrovic on Patreon um, just asked, 
uh, he he wants to know, he talked about Alan Alda dedicating a lot of time and money and effort into educating scientists about how to communicate with the general public and asked of you, how has your acting uh, training helped you communicate with your students and with the general public about your research and discoveries? And has it helped any way in getting funding for your research? Mm, I love that question. Um, thank you for asking it. You know, when I first came back to grad school, so the second time around, I had, it had been 11 years between my PhD program in astrophysics, the first one, and the second one, which I started in the fall of 2009. And I had my MFA in acting by that time. And So you're, you're know, actually to, 70 years old, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the name of my, my dermatologist. To <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had a trifecta of issues that made for like fertile soil for the imposter syndrome to take root. I had, I was an African-American female in a field dominated by white men. Just to be clear, the, um, af- the, the imposter syndrome is where you are actually qualified to do what you're doing, but your confidence doesn't measure up to that. It, yeah. And you, f- and you're right. left uh, uh, uncomfortable in that setting. Did, did I capture that right? That's right. So yeah, I, okay. I felt like at any at any moment I was going to be found out for the fraud that I was. You know, African American female, um, older returning students. I was 34 years old the second time around, starting a PhD program with everyone else was straight out of undergrad, so they were like 22, 23. Um, and I was a classically trained actor in an astronomy PhD program. And that last part is why that's con- the connection to this question because I thought at first that I had to sort of sweep that like unseemly foray into the humanities under the rug. People in the department were like, they thought it was really cool lunchtime talk. Like, oh, you have this MFA in acting. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm here for astronomy. Um, I My very first journal club talk, a journal club talk is when um, for grad students, usually you present someone else's paper. So a paper that someone else has written about some astronomical phenomenon. Um, in like a 20 minute talk, you kind of do an overview of the paper, maybe show a few of the figures from the paper and then take questions. And my first talk, the first one that I had to give, it was like, I went completely deer in the headlights. It wasn't the presentation part, that part I was fine with. I, I was a classically trained actor. I was used to getting up in front of people and talking. But what I wasn't used to was people talking back to me asking me questions. There's this thing in in the theater called the fourth wall, which is an invisible (laughs) wall between all of us performing up here on stage and the audience. And nobody breaks that fourth wall unless they're invited, um, like in some kind of call and response. So the fact that in a science talk, people can ask questions during a talk, after the talk, even before the talk. Wait, Nagin, let me just clarify here. What she's saying is people are up in your face. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, what I'm hearing is... It's not just sitting back. It's like, wait a minute. Is that... (laughs) What I'm hearing is They're like coming at me like arrows. Right. Academia, this is what it sounds like. It sounds like a comedy club on a Saturday night at 10 p.m. where you've got a lot of drunk hecklers. That's what academia is sounding like to me right now. Is that accurate? Is it... Minus the alcohol, I think. Were you essentially being heckled by uh, astrophysicists? That's how I took it. That's how I took it. I had no, I see, and this is like, I, I came so far over the course of that five years because now what I see a science talk is, is it's a conversation. It's a discussion. People ask you questions because they actually care and are interested and care about what you've presented. In fact, not getting questions is worse than get, than, than it's so much worse because that means people probably fell asleep or they just want to get to lunch. So it's actually and again, if someone thing. finds an error in her work, first of all, that's good. Second, you want it to happen there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. Wait, with so people like, who are actually your right. your local colleagues, right, and not out that's in right. the out. In so the, I take it there isn't a bouncer at the lecture halls <laughs> that like ejects people who are asking too many no. questions. Yeah, there should no be. One that, there no should one be. that. That will protect you, you know, and, and, and I and I certainly felt it felt like a verbal assault when I was new, when I was, you know, when I didn't, when I wasn't able to see the, the other side of it. Right. And so I, I remember talking to a professor 
um, later about it. And he was like, you know, take a moment, take a breath. When someone asks a question, take a breath, let it land. And then if you have information, if you have something to contribute, say, you know, say it. If you don't say, I don't know, I can look that up and get back to you. End of story. Like it didn't have to be the big deal that it was in my head. Right. Um, and so now, so many years after that, what I can say is this, my acting background absolutely does not only contribute, but it, it makes me such a much better scientist than I would have been without it. Because not only can I communicate the significance of my research results, and I can do it in ways that people who are not scientists would understand without talking down to them, without assuming they know things that they may not have decided to learn yet. Um, I know how to do that because of the acting background. And I also know how to network because that's all that acting is, is like <laughs> you have to like introduce yourself at yeah. parties. And like, I knew how to be a marketer. And as a scientist, you actually are a business person. You got to market yourself. You got to get out and shake it, so to speak. And um, to get that next job or that next, you know, that, so wait, that Neil, connections. Neil, are you inspired at all to get an MFA in acting, hearing all of this? Well, so here's what happened. I've been asked on occasion to give like cameo appearances. And like, I'm actually, I'm in six, is it six, five or six feature length films in very small cameo roles playing myself or someone very uh, approximating myself. And if you look at the early ones, uh, I suck. <laughs> It was like, there's this gap between my first couple of appearances and the next time, because people said, we're not inviting him back at all. So, but but this sign of baptism, rather than a formal training, I think I've gotten better at this over the years. And I have to agree with Aomawa, it's, it is definitely infuses every aspect of how you interact with people and how you communicate, your facial expressions, your body language, your your gestures, how you're thinking about how the person is thinking about what you're saying. All that an actor has to think about when they're performing. And so yes, I, I, I have to agree. But Omawa has, has got it, the formal training where she can dig deep into that far deeper than any place I ever have to go uh, in my own profile. But it's let me add something, uh, because the, oh, the question uh, started off mentioning Alan Alda. I don't know how many people know, yeah, yeah. but Alan Alda used to host Scientific American Presents. Uh, it was I, it might have been Science Channel or Discovery Channel. And so he was he liked science, and he's always liked science. And he would walk into a lab and be just like a regular person asking blunt questions. And he noticed that scientists had a hard time figuring out how to communicate back with him. And he said he wants to change that. And so he co-founded an entire school at the State University of New York, Stony Brook on Long Island, where their, their whole purpose is to train professors and graduate students how to communicate the science that is their profession. And, uh, but uh, Aomawa was like doing this from scratch. And so you're the OG. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love I love his center. I've spoken with um, with people at his center. I love the what they're dedicated to. Um, it's very close to my heart. And it's you know, I've, there's a course that I teach now here at UC Irvine that's communication skills for physicists and astronomers. And it's you know not just how to put a talk together, but how to deliver that talk to a broad range of audiences. And the same thing, like Neil was saying, you have to, when you give a science talk, there's an objective, just like an actor in a scene on stage or in a movie. And it's not just say the lines, the objective might be, you know, to get the person to give me the money to get all the way to the other side of the bridge. Like you have, in, in acting school, we learn you have to have an objective with every scene. It's the same thing as a scientist. What do I want to do in this talk, do I want to inspire? Do I want to um, wait? Uh, Omar, are you surprise? saying it's real when actors say, 
what's my motivation? That's a real thing. <laughs> That's a real thing. <laughs> no, I didn't want to believe that was a real thing, but you're telling me that's a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you ask, Omoa, you ask Omoa, what's your motivation at any point? And she's just going to say smog, you know? <laughs> that's so. right. That's the, that was what motivated <laughs> the whole thing. The motivation. <laughs> Let's go to get another nice question. Nuggets. Let's get it. Okay, so we have actually Zeke Majed Bradwinter and Chase Kimes from uh, Patreon all asked about terraforming. Um, and so basically the question is like, how possible is terraforming with our current technology? Do we have enough public interest to actually pursue it? I love it. What do you I love think? It. Go for it. And tell us what terraforming is first. Well, my understanding of terraforming is the the principle behind it is that we would change or we would be dedicated to the action of, of trying to change a planet, an existing planet's environment, atmosphere, ecosystem to be more um, uh, amenable to life as we would want it. Um, so perhaps creating an environment in the most extreme case, which I, you know, out of a, a Mars or a Venus, you might want to create an Earth. And how would you go about doing that? Um, and so that you could create a planet where life could actually survive and thrive. Now, the way but you I began think, your answer there, it sounds like this is not in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> well, you began saying it's kind of, we think it could be like, maybe this is what we might <laughs> think of doing. That It sounds like this is not around well, the corner. The tentativeness that you picked up in my voice is more related to my, to be honest, moral stance on the concept of terraforming than any sort of science. Well, are you all getting Star sense. Trek on us? The prime directive, do prime not directive. interfere with. Well, I, it's it's more of a it is more of a should we than could we question for me. Um, and there are beyond Star Trek, there actually are other scientists, Lucianne Walkowitz, who has an excellent TED talk about this this whole um, question of let's not use Mars as a backup planet. Uh, I think that's. Either the, either the subtitle or the primary title of her TED talk. Um, this idea of, yes, let's go explore. Let's go explore so that we have environments as backup in case we screw up the earth too badly to be repaired. Um, and is, this that like, is, is this like a dog peeing on all the trees that, that are out there? Is this, which, <laughs> is this the same thing? Well, I, feel I, like, mean, I, I feel like this is when I buy um, a pair of pants that are like clearly two sizes too small. And I'm always like, I'll get there. You know what I mean? But I know I'm never really going to get there. I just wasted money on a pair of pants, you know? <laughs> it's wishful so. thinking. But, but, but <laughs> what is the morality if the, the, this, okay, wait. So let's unpack this. It's one thing to say, why are you making Mars a backup plan? Why don't you just tend to earth as we should? So that's one moral posture. Another moral, another posture is, uh, these other planets, they might have life of their own and we're just mm -hmm. taking over. But if you confirm that they don't have life of their own, what's your, what's your problem? What, you got any problem? You got a problem with that? <laughs> hmm. Interesting question. Yeah. If, it, if the planet is sterile, then who cares if you pitch tent there? Yeah, I'd have to think more about that. Uh, there is an entire planetary protection department at places like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA's JPL, that is devoted to this, this like that question of we make sure that we don't we don't bring life with us to some place where we're looking for life and think, oh, we found life, but the life we found was the life we brought with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody sneezed on the detector. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And also, if we got there, to make sure that you know that we're that our detection equipment is um, robust enough to be able to pick up on the life that we would imagine might be there. But here's the thing, how would we, how could we be sure that a planet absolutely unequivocally was completely sterile and had no life or promise of life evolving on that planet so, such that we could then shape it and mold it however we want. Oh, so you could just um, sterilize it yourself, and then <laughs> that's how you. Yeah, can that's one way. <laughs> and that's you know, I, way. And actually, I mean, I, I have people very close to me feel feel quite differently about this. Um, my husband and I have debates about this all the time. I think he would take that stance of like, yeah, if there's not life on there, why? But the thing is, 
life as we know it might be very different from other life, life that doesn't have water as its primary solvent. Everything on earth, everything from the tiniest microbe to the largest elephant, everything requires water. I, I saw a cool comic where two aliens crashed in the desert and they're like crawling along the, the dunes and they're saying, ammonia, ammonia. <laughs> <laughs> right? right. Uh, yeah, there could be some other other kind of solvent that we would have no way of or had not even thought about, much less thought about enough to form formulate a plan to create a detector that might be able to pick up on that um, in some way or a you know spectrom spectrometer or something. Um, so I, I think. Okay, so you're no fun. You just want to fix Earth. You know that's not fun at all. But <laughs> I'd, I'd like to fix Earth, and I'd like to explore for the sake of exploring, not for the sake of changing to fit our standards or what we what we think we would need. And our engineer just found the the talk. Is, the TED talk is Lucianne Walkowitz, right? As you said, and the actual title of the talk is "Let's Not Use Mars as a Backup Planet." And so, yeah, that's that. This is the, the name of the talk, not even the subtitle. So there you have it. Uh, Nagin, we got to take another break. Okay. When we come back to our third segment, uh, we might have to go into a, a lightning round uh, so we can get more of those questions in. Uh, you're watching or listening to Star Talk Cosmic Queries. And this is all about search for life on exoplanets when we return. Star Talk Cosmic Queries Edition. We're talking about exoplanets and the possibility of them harboring life with one of the world's expert on that very subject, and it's Amawa Shields. Amawa, welcome to Star Talk. And Nagin, of course, my co host, my guest co host for this. And you've got all the questions with you. But before we go into that, uh, Nagin, how do people find you online? Oh my gosh, you can find me at Nagin Farsad, N E G I N F A R S A D. And, uh, and, uh, and anything on, separating your first and last name? No, or? just right through on Instagram, right, on TikTok, through. on okay. Twitter. Uh, and oh, th oh, the fun you will have uh, reading through my things. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we'll be the judge of that. Okay. <laughs> and Aomo, okay. what, what, uh, other than your website where you're, you're um, encouraging girls to rise up to their fullest potential. Uh, how else might we find you on social media? Yes, well, you can uh, find my faculty website at just Google UCI and my name. You can put in my first name only, Aomoa, and yeah, that that's Yeah, that's, that'll find you anywhere in the world, I bet. That's right. <laughs> A-O-M-A-W-A, -A -A. Aomoa. That's yeah, that's all. So, so you can just drop your, drop shields. Who needs shields? You, we have we have like Prince, Madonna, Cher. Cher. I thought about Omar. it. I thought about it. That, Nagin, let's start doing it. That's how we'll do it with her. Okay. Now. Okay. And then my Twitter handle, my Twitter handle is also my first name only, at Aomoa. As it should be. Okay. So Nagin, let's, let's, let's see how many of these we can knock out in this third and final segment. All right. Here we go. And by Michael. the way, I think all these questions, we're now only taking questions from Patreon, mem uh, from our Patreon uh, support. So, so if Michael, you want to be able to ask a question, you know, jump on in. Join okay. the Patreon. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael Main, one of your members, asks, it is, it, sorry, it is my understanding that volatile magnetic fields of red dwarf stars periodically cause a large star solar flares, which adversely affect planets within the star's Goldilocks zone. Is it possible for life to survive on these star-blasted worlds? Um, I didn't understand that question at all. So this is where... <laughs> and I was going to say, my response is going to say, take that, Omoa. <laughs> what do you think of that? Because you're studying low-mass stars, which are cool and red, and they, mm -hmm. they're very susceptible to, to flares and things. So how yes. do you get out of that one? I think we backed yeah. into a, a corner, Nagin. So let's see what oh. happens here. I'm going to do my best. Oh, I feel it. Yeah. This is a very popular question that I get at Science Talks, which I now welcome instead of uh, fear, as we talked about before. <laughs> I, love, <laughs> I love the questions. And yes, yeah, so the one thing about these low mass stars, these red, cool M dwarf or red dwarf stars, um, they have a lot of advantages. They're 70% of all stars. It's easier to detect planets around these stars. They live forever, like even forever, forever compared to regular stars. Um, like trillions I mean of years. That, like trillions. trillions. So no, no red dwarf stars have ever died. 
That's how long their lifetimes are. Their lifetimes are longer than the current age of the universe. So no stars, no red dwarf stars have ever died. But so it seems to me you could evolve some badass creatures if you were around for that long, right, <laughs> on a planet. Yeah. So that's the other, another advantage is that they would permit long time scales for both planetary and biological evolution. Um, but when they have these long lifetimes, that means that this like, so all stars are really active when they're young. Um, and think of this as like a terrible twos phase for those who have kids. I have a daughter who's um, three and a half and like, yeah, her terrible twos phase is still going on. <laughs> it became terrible threes. But, like, yeah, okay. that's right. but the, the terrible twos phase for red dwarf stars can last as long as a billion years. Like that's that's some terrible twos phase. And during that time, the planets around these stars in this so-called Goldilocks zone, habitable zone, that region around a star where a planet could be not too hot or not too cold for water to stay liquid on the surface. That's what we call the Goldilocks zone. Planets in that zone could be pelted by all of this high energy radiation during this terrible twos phase. This um, And that that could threaten the atmospheres of these planets. It could threaten biology. We know that, for example, UV radiation is harmful to biology. That's why we wear sunscreen. Um, but think of it as like UV radiation on steroids um, for life on a planet orbiting a red dwarf star. And that could be, but I'll say that, so that could be bad for sure. And that's certainly a, one of the largest disadvantages that people have brought up for, for life orbiting I feel a butt coming. Okay, but. <laughs> but okay. if you're, we know that there's tons of life in the ocean. So you could still have life doing its thing and being nice and sheltered from UV radiation if it was at the bottom of the ocean or even just a couple of hundred meters below the surface. Um, and, you know, there's that terrible two space, even though it lasts as long as a billion years, it doesn't last forever. Um, and it could be that atmospheres are thick enough, for example, to withstand that radiation. And we've done some studies to show that under certain circumstances, you might not, for example, deplete an entire ozone layer by that high energy radiation pelting the atmosphere. You could still have some left over. So it depends is the short answer. Okay. To that, to that All right. So it's not as bad as, so it is real that these are threats but those threats don't exhaust all possible ways you could survive them. Correct. Yeah, okay. All right. All right, keep it going, Nagin. All right, Charles Maloof asks, if Earth was about to be destroyed and you had to board a ship bound for another planet where you would spend the rest of your life, which destination would you choose at the t ticket counter? And you should assume <laughs> there's already a habitable facility there and travel speed is a significant percentage of sea so you don't age much from the journey. <laughs> <laughs> they, they got this all figured out, huh? They sure, they sure do. do. They sure do. So, Aomawa, what is your favorite Gosh. planet? That's really what that comes down to. Yes, yes, it does. Um, I have a soft spot for a planet called Kepler-62f. And I say that wistfully because this planet is 1,200 light years away. Um, and so it's very right, unlikely. So you're leaving that the solar system for this des destination. <laughs> I don't, was that allowed, Nagin, in this setup? <laughs> <laughs> We'd have to. We'd have to. We're going to another. Oh, you! See, I kept thinking exoplanets. But yeah, because you have exoplanets on the brain. But that's okay. We'll take it. They say, I'll okay, take it. So it could be. I guess. It yeah, could be like within our solar system, like a. Yeah, it's still. Would well, give me exoplanet. give me both answers. So in the solar system, what would it be? Um, well, Jupiter's moon Europa is certainly a place that everyone is excited about, and I've always loved because we're fairly certain that there is an ocean there, except mm. the ocean is below potentially kilometers thick ice. Um, so a very, very thick ice shell on top and then and then a wait, 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 salty wait, wait. ocean. Aomawa, you're thinking about, you're thinking like a scientist, all right? You're thinking you go there because that'd be cool to study it. He, it sounds like he just said, where do you want to go to live? <laughs> yeah, where are we hanging out? Where you are you going to hang mean? out? Thank where you. Where are you brunching? Like where are you doing <laughs> girls weekends? Like what, you know? <laughs> on another planet. Yeah. Um, I always think about that on our planet. It's funny. I, I, ever since I had a child, it's like, I don't want, I don't, 
I wouldn't want to leave. Like I wouldn't want to leave. You bring to your to kids a- with you. And then and if you can survive them saying, are we there yet? You know, then it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna choose. I'm gonna choose Neptune because it's my daughter's favorite planet, and she she loves it because it's. Blue. Um, and we haven't talked about ammonia and how that does that and all that, but just because it's blue, and I think that'd be fun. Um, I, I would take then, any moon of Saturn because then you can look up and see Saturn in the night sky. Oh yeah, and that's gorgeous, gotta be, gorgeous. That's got to be beautiful. Yeah, so tell me more nice. about Kepler 62L. So Kepler 62F is this. Oh F. Yes, it's uh, 1,200 light years away. It's one of a five-planet system orbiting this this K star. So a little bit a little bit cooler than the sun, not as cool as a red dwarf star. Um, and it's really it's one of the first planets that we were able to. My team was actually able to look at how the gravitational interactions between this planet and and its siblings. So this planet is not alone in its system. It's got four other siblings that are also revolve, you know, going around Kepler 62, its its parent star, how those interactions, how they can push and pull on each other and how that affects the climate of this planet. And that's what I study is how the the climate of exoplanets um, is determined by a myriad of factors including how planets push and pull on each other. And so this Okay, is so you're biased cuz like you studied the damn thing. This is like you, I did. you take ownership. You've already planted the flag. The Almawawa <laughs> Shields flag. Planted my That's virtual what. flag. Okay. There you go. Yeah, and so I'd love to be able to go and see and test some of the theories and predictions we made um, cool. on this planet. All right. All right. Again, thinking like a scientist, how not much just would hanging you, out on the beach. <laughs> how much would you age? I know. <laughs> That's right. all I'm thinking about. <laughs> how much would you age, though, going to that planet, to that exoplanet? Oh, I mean, it, we're assuming this question said a few percentage, a few percent of the speed of light. I mean, if we if we were somehow able to a, a, obtain light speed, um, it would still take us 1,200 years to get there God. and 1,200 years to get back. Um, wait, so wait, you pretty... wouldn't age, but we'd all be long dead and all your, everyone would have forgotten <laughs> right. about you if you come back that's to Earth. True, that's true. So just yes, go and, and just don't come back and you're, you're cool. You're fine. So <laughs> the Nagin, keep thing, them coming. Yeah. Here we go. Chaz uh, Jen Carelli says, when looking for other habitable planets, do we also look for signs of other life that's not carbon-based? I know silicon-based life mm-hmm. has been talked about, but curious of the signs of other based life is easy to scope out. I love this question because I'm always like, are you looking for carbon and then also like gummy bears and also like what i mean what is the list of the things that you're looking for you know yeah are we and how biased are we in this in the in these criteria we're very biased i mean our our n if in scientific parlance our n is 1 meaning we have one example of a planet that we know is habitable earth that's it and so we're we're using everything we know life needs on earth as our metric for where else to look for life, what to look for on those planets. Um, and this is where the water can... bias comes in, right? Because we all need that's water. Right. And yeah, you're so saying, well, we need three... water, so clearly everybody else needs water. Yeah. And there's three things, there's three fundamental requirements that we've identified that life needs on Earth. And it's liquid water, it's an energy source, and in some cases that's the sun, in other cases it might be um, just chemicals for life that's underneath at the bottom of the ocean and doesn't have access to, to sunlight. So stellar or chemical energy and some sort of environment to form complex organic molecules from like a, a sen- elements essential to biology, like sulfur and phosphorus and oxygen and nitrogen and carbon. And so nitrogen. that environment would have to be like the right temperature and the right pressure to sustain big molecules to experiment well, and, the- and make so- anything complex. This is why water is the most critical of those three, because a terrestrial planet by nature has some kind of energy source and the basic building blocks in some form that are needed for life. But what isn't as common is liquid water. And you can see that really in our own solar system. Um, And that's what we know all life on earth needs is liquid water. And so we we use that as our you know as our criterion but as this question points out it is limiting 
um, because there might be other ways. And there are astrobiologists and an astrobiologist is someone, it could be an astronomer, but it could also be an oceanographer. It could be a geologist. Astrobiologists are, are very interdisciplinary. They're using their primary field of expertise to address questions related to the life elsewhere, to answer the question of, how, you know, are we alone? Um, what's the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe? So, Nagin, um, I want to find a planet that doesn't depend on water, that it, that it, it depends on wine. That would be <laughs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, grapes are a big industry there. <laughs> no, actually, wine is mostly water, of course. So I, I, I kid. I kid. So, yeah. Nagin, so, yeah, we got to so, go. It's serious uh, lightning round now. So, uh, oh, okay. Aomawa, you've got to answer questions in one word or one sentence at most. Oh, my okay? gosh. Let's okay. go. No. Yes. Nagin, no. Go. Um, okay. Uh, Heidi Wagamans asks, are we able to get to other habitable planets if the universe expands so fast? By the way, from the the uh, um, Heidi is from the Netherlands. Oh, cool! Mm -hmm. Ooh, um, yes, the universe is expanding. Um, however, we, especially because of recent recent times, we now have a new mission, a relatively new mission called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. We call it TESS for short. It's the successor to NASA's Kepler mission, which stared at one patch of sky for about 10 years and just kept taking pictures looking for planets that passed in front of their host star from our viewing angle. And we actually looked, we saw little dips in the light of the star when the planet, planet passed in front of those stars. So TESS is actually an all sky survey and it's looking at stars in the nearby solar neighborhood. So because of that, we're finding a lot more um, a lot more planets, first off, around these cool, small red stars, because they're the most uh, abundant stars in the solar neighborhood anyway. And those planets are much closer to us. They're going to be easier to follow up on, to look at with next generation telescopes, and hopefully one day to try to journey to. Okay, that wasn't a one word or a one sentence answer. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how else to do it. <laughs> also, uh, the expansion of the universe, our galaxy will hang tight for a while, even in the expanding universe. So I think yep. we're okay. And it's great to hear that we're discovering many more that are nearby, in case we're going to make that escape list. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we'll round keep, up the billionaires and we'll escape. keep the beach destinations in mind when you're putting <laughs> together that list, you guys. Okay, let's get one more. One, one more. more. We Nagin. have from Ashley Kosdorf, um, a Floridian. I've been wondering what a black hole does for the universe from a circle of life aspect. Most things on Earth are recycled. However, black holes seem to only consume. They're not, mm. yeah, black holes aren't recycling. What's up with that? <laughs> Are they are they the like the landfill of of the sky or what? Did I is that accurate? That is so funny. I just watched. I was just watching um, Loki, the uh, the Marvel show Loki, the other day, and there's yeah, Loki's whole, Thor's brother or something. Thor's right? brother, yeah, 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 the god of mischief. Um, but he's sort of taking a moral turn in this. I won't give it away. Um, but there's this whole notion of like what comes after, and and this creature that this void that kind of consumes all matter. And um, I mean, I think the answer, my, I guess it's what my three word answer would be, I don't know. And I believe we don't know. Um, right. So the two, I don't knows that a scientist can utter. One of them is they don't know. And the other, I don't know is no one knows because we don't have yes. the answer yet at all, no matter exactly. who you ask. So, but I love how like basically this was a real, this is really judgmental towards black holes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and we haven't, I haven't heard very many uh, approaches to black holes that are like, you know, they just consume, consume. They don't care about anybody else, you know. Well, I think so. Here's the issue. Here's how selfish black holes, win. black holes, selfish black holes. Here's how they win the day. The reason why we recycle is because we don't want what we just use to, to litter the environment. That's the only motivation to recycle, right. uh, as, as in addition to whether the material is, is, is renewable, right? But that, that's why. If it's, if it's not renewable, you get to use it again and there you don't, and you, it, you don't discard it on the, on, the, on, the, on the shoreline. A black hole eats it, you will never find it on anybody's shore after that. Mm. You won't find it anywhere. It's not in landfill. You're right, Nagin, it is its own landfill. 
Uh, yeah. But, but it's take it smells don't come out. It, it's not unsightly. It's not a not in my backyard thing. In fact, everyone should have a black hole in their backyard. Well, and there's a black hole at the center of every galaxy, right? So maybe that's that's it. Omawa. Here's what we do. So when we have galactic federations, that's the garbage chute for all the <laughs> trash that we collect in the galaxy. I like it. Can I also just yes. say, we don't know that if in black holes there isn't like a giant Etsy shop that's selling <laughs> repurposed, <laughs> repurposed, repurposed from stars, renovated like cute handbags. Okay. Are you so sure that's you a want to throw this away? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Actually, some models for the interior of black holes have them open up an entire other space time continuum so that, in fact, things that fall through intact could emerge on the other side, separate from our universe, uh, entering a whole other universe created by the black hole itself. And I'm surprised that I, 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 there's not as much science fiction that has exploited that understanding of black holes as I think should. But anyhow, yeah. guys, we got to call it quits there. <laughs> I, I, Omoa, this, you, you've been away too long, okay? And <laughs> delighted to have you. Uh, this is a very popular topic. And we, and we have a lot of interest, deep interest in this. And maybe we can get you back on and continue it. Or especially when, when Tess, uh, is Tess, uh, what's the status of Tess right now? Tess is flying and they've actually found many potentially habitable planets now. So, so maybe now we can we get sort of an update on Tess. To on. Yeah, because we didn't specifically talk about Tess in this episode. But uh, Transiting Explorer Survey Telescope? Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Um, and uh, I think we'd welcome uh, just an update on what some of the findings are from that next generation of our search for exoplanets. So, Aumawa, uh, thank you for being on Star Talk. Thank you for having me, everybody. All right. And Nagin, always good to have you. Oh, my God. Thanks so much for having me. I learned something today. Okay. That, that's what this is about. <laughs> So, but you I said it as though are like real jerk offs. That's what oh. I learned. <laughs> but Nagin, the way you said that, so other times I did this, I didn't learn a damn thing. Uh. That, that was kind of you copped the attitude there. Admit it. <laughs> well, I, I almost really used her skills on me. I, I really, you know, I really felt like I got something. All right, that's how that's how we roll. So this has been Star Talk Cosmic Queries. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. As always, I bid you to keep looking up. <laughs>